Uh, I, wanna, I want you to go with me to Hebrews 2.15. Hebrews 2.15. Eight o'clock in the morning, I get to teach. I, I fly back tomorrow. And, no, not eight o'clock in the morning. Eight o'clock Friday morning. <laughs> eight o'clock in the morning, I'll probably be asleep. But uh, I, I go back and I teach uh, Friday morning in, in Colorado. I'm teaching on women in ministry. So if you're interested, come on down. <laughs> and uh, you'll get to learn about that. that, that that's a word that, that frees a lot of women. And uh, it's a real blessing. So anyway, looking forward to that. Uh, Hebrews 2.15. It says, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. I want to talk to you about fear tonight, about being released from fear. There, this is a huge, huge subject. But the more I meditate on this, the more I realize how much our lives have been shaped by fear. And the reason, and the deeper I think about this, the deeper I go into it, I realize that the moment that Adam and Eve sinned, fear took over the world. Fear took over the human race. They were the human race at that point. But the, the power of fear has enslaved humanity, and fear has many different symptoms and many different manifestations. But it says again, and release those, this is Jesus came, to release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Any fear in our lives that we've tolerated is a place of bondage. It's a place where we have not allowed the abundant life to take over. Fear is a tremendous thief, and we could substitute uh, the word fear comes to steal, kill, and destroy. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Well, fear is one of the, the greatest weapons. Fear is the nature of fallen man. Uh, 2 Timothy 1.7 says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. And what that is referring to is that fallen man, the moment he unplugged himself from God and became independent, fear became his, his nature. His default position was fear. Everything became fear. And fear has different ways to manifest. Fear can be the, the obvious trembling, shaking kind of, of bondage, or it can be reversed and put into a gigantic ego kind of an approach to the world, a very a great arrogance to the world, but the root, the root is the same. There is still a fear that is the foundation of fallen man. That is the default position of fallen man. And that default position of fear is bondage. And when we're in bondage in any area of our lives, we are not free to enjoy what God has promised us, what God has given us. So fear is a powerful, powerful thing. And I look back on my own life, and I see, I see the, the evolution, if I can use that word in a good way, the evolution of my life from the moment I got born again and the, over the years, and I could say even over the decades, the chains of fear breaking and falling off as I continue to move into the truths of the gospel and understand what Jesus did for me, and I get freer and freer and freer and freer. And life gets better and better and better the more I'm able to recognize fear and reject it and grasp the, the grace of God that he has provided for me. So I, 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 my heart right now, as I minister this, minister this to you, so whether you hear me or not, I hope that you'll hear the Holy Spirit tonight. Uh, many times I'm sitting in a message and it's not the message that sets me free, but it's in the environment of the message that the Holy Spirit sets me free. And so whether or not this word gets to you, allow your heart to be touched by the Holy Spirit. I really know he wants to set a lot of you free tonight. Uh, if, I mean, if you're a people, I think everybody in here is a people, is a person. Uh, we, have, we have things we deal with. We have fears. We, ha uh, we have fear. I, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but there are people that are probably afraid of the dark. I've known people that are afraid to learn how to drive. I've known people that are afraid of heights. I've known people that are afraid of jumping into ice cold water with a hole in the ice. <laughs> uh, no, that's not, that's not fear, that's wisdom. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, you know, we've known people, or you are people, that have had certain things in your life, fear of failure, fear of success, mm -hmm. because success requires management. People have a fear of that. And so we have all kinds of different fears that are going on. And here's the thing is that if you refuse to identify those and you just live your life with blinders on and don't want to deal with those things, you can get through life. You'll, you'll get born again and you'll go to heaven. 
but you will not have enjoyed what God had in mind for you because you've allowed something that he conquered to remain a Lord in your life. And so that's, that's where I get agitated. I get upset. I don't want anything in my life to be Lord other than Jesus the Lord. And so if there's a fear in my life, I want to recognize it. I want to say, okay, this is, I'm still dealing with this. I want to get this out of my life. So I, I got a list of things here. How much of our lives have been shaped by fear? Fear of death, fear of disease. Man, that's, that's sold all the time on TV. I mean, it's incredible how they try to peddle disease and the miracle drug with all the side effects, <laughs> right? And so then you don't know whether you should fear the disease or the side effects. All right, fear of disease, fear of tragedy, fear of rejection. Stop here and talk about high school. <laughs> I won't do that, okay. Fear of failure. These are powerful forces that can dominate our thoughts and steal our dreams. How many dreams have we put on the shelf because there was some bondage, some fear that kept us from stepping into that new thing? Fear of public speaking. I'll talk about that more in a minute. Fear of driving, fear of high places, fear of flying, fear of sleeping in the dark, fear of not having enough money. All of these things in some way, shape, or form have, have molded us and it's been amplified by the world, amplified by the news, amplified perhaps by your parents. I think when I was here at one other occasion, I talked about the power of expectation and that my mother was a professional worrier. Anyone have a mother like that? And so her, she worried me into a life of fear, uh, which I've been able to break free from, praise God. And she didn't do it on purpose, consciously. It was just that was what was in her, and it transmitted. And so we have all of these fears shaping us, and then you go and you turn on the TV, and what does Hollywood love to sell? <coughs> Scary movies. There's something, and people that go to those, I question, well, <laughs> there's something wrong with you, okay? <laughs> That's about as polite as I can make that. Uh, but, but wanting to be terrified, I think is a mental disorder. <laughs> But, but that sells. People buy those movies by the, by the boat, boatload. They, for some reason, enjoy being terrified. But even movies that aren't about terror, but have other aspects of this could happen to you. This could happen to you. This, I don't know why anybody watches. I'm, gonna, I'm just being transparent, and if you get offended, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm leaving in the morning, so. Uh, Hosp hospital TV shows. Why would anybody in their right mind watch a hospital TV show? I don't get it. I know I just stepped on some toes, but they need stepping on. Uh, but anything that puts fear in you, WebMD. You can't go, I haven't been on that. I, when, when it first came out, I may have looked at it once and thought, I can't, I can't go there because you'll diagnose yourself with every disease on the whole website, you know? But that is an attraction that, that natural man has to bondage. There's a lot there. But for some reason, natural men that have not seen the light of the glory of God still have a natural affinity or an attraction to be bound up in fear. And, I, and you say, that doesn't make any sense. I know it doesn't make any sense. But that's truth, is that we allow fear to shape us more than we allow the Word of God to shape us. In fact, some of us have a concept of God that is so weird that we think God really is the, is the, the one making us go through all of this. I wrote a post, I had a post that came up this morning on my public figure page, uh, uh, Facebook page, and a couple of comments showed up while I was out eating and, uh, and I got back to the room and looked at these comments, and they were debating me, which I don't, don't allow. Uh, <laughs> it's my page. And so, uh, but I, I realized they're debating. I'm talking about, what was the post about? Anyway, it was about the goodness of God in some way, shape, or form. And debating me, but making God, and I re well, it, came to my, it came to me, okay, I see where they're coming from. In their mind, God is a mad scientist, and we're the lab rats. And he gets to do whatever he wants to, 
to test us and to do these things to us. And, and when that's your concept of God, then you can't help but live in fear because you're attributing all the evil in your life to God who is somehow manipulating you for his own pleasure. Like, like you're a lab rat and he's, he's just this wild mad scientist wanting to do things to you. When that's where you begin, if that's your base theology, then I, there's not much hope for your life. But that's another, it's just another aspect of fear. Fear is controlling so many people's lives. There are so many gifts in this room right now. There are so many, we'll talk about purpose in a minute. So many purposes, so many giftings, so many talents, so much potential sitting in this room right now that is locked up behind doors of fear. And if those doors don't get broken down, they'll never see the light of day. And the things God has for you will never get released. And so what I'm, what I'm trying to do and what's happening in me is that, to me, fear is an enemy. And I want you to see fear as an enemy. Fear is something that you can slay. It's a dragon you are equipped to kill. In whatever part of your life, you can kill fear. You can do it. Fear was the initial reaction of Adam and Eve to the guilt they felt after sinning. Fear is the dominant force of the fallen human spirit. Fear is the product the world sells most effectively. Most of the decisions in our lives that we make have couched around them fears. But what about, but what about? And we live our lives not ever experiencing the full freedom that Christ died to give us. The joy of the Lord can't be your strength if you think the Lord is your problem. The joy of the Lord can't be your strength if you're busy bowing the knee to fears that people have sown in you. And if we can take this back to last night, the first message, it's an image that has been sown into you by friends, family, Hollywood, news, what have you. But that image, part of the image that we project many times is an image of fear. And we try to dress it up and call it something else, but it's basically, it's bondage. It's not allowing you to be who God created you to be. Just as faith, this, the Lord just showed me this today, just as faith releases God's goodness, fear releases corruption and loss. Faith releases the goodness of God into your life and the lives of others. But fear releases corruption, loss, bondage. Fear, I, I, I want you to hate it. I want you to hate it, at least get, try, to, try to get where I'm at at this, at this point right now. That fear is an enemy that is stealing, it could be stealing your marriage, it could be stealing your kids, it could be stealing your purpose in God. There are many things that might be getting stolen. And so if we can identify this and recognize it and then learn what to do about it and get set free, life can change tremendously. I want to talk about three kinds of fear with you. I'm going to tell three of my favorite stories tonight. Some of you may have heard them, but I don't care. They're, they're good, good stories. But, but the first kind of fear I want to talk about is the fear of God, but not the fear of God in the positive sense. But I'm talking about afraid that God is your problem in that sense. So many people don't come to God because they're afraid of what God is going to do if they do come to God. Someone asked me to tell a story. I, I just remembered this. I read a little note that I got last night. Uh, please tell this story. And so it's not part of my message, but I think I can make this fit, is that I had that concept when I was in college that I didn't, I was just learning how to sin when I got to college. I was getting up to speed in sin. And uh, my friend and I used to, on Saturday nights, we didn't have any money, so we, I was at Texas A&M, and so we would hitchhike up and down the main drag of, the, of College Station, Bryan College Station, which is about 11 or 12 miles long. And it was where everything was. And so we would walk off campus and put out our thumb and get rides and go up and down the strip on a Saturday night. That's what we did for fun. And we met all kinds of interesting people. Uh, and in one case, it was raining. And so this guy pulls up and says, get on in. So we jumped in the car and uh, we take off down the road. And he says, you boys know Jesus? <laughs> And I looked at him, and I turned, and I said, you can let us off right here. Because I didn't want to hear that. I was afraid of what that meant. 
I thought, no Jesus, what is that going to do to my life? I, I'm having too much fun right now. I don't want to know Jesus. I don't want to know what that is. I had a fear of God, but not a healthy fear of God. So I'm gonna, let me tell you a story here. There was a, there was a fellow that uh, decided he wanted to develop a fish that could breathe out of water, could live out of water. And so he went through several generations of fish and a lot of DNA and all kinds of stuff and trying to develop this fish. And finally, after years of trying, he has this fish that's in this plastic aquarium or something like this, acrylic aquarium, but it's just dry. And the fish is just lying there, breathing. <sighs> okay, and he's eureka, he did it. He is so excited. And so he picks this thing up and he starts running across the campus to show his colleagues this fish that can live and breathe out, out of water. And as he's running across a footbridge over a creek, he trips, throws the thing up in the air, the fish flies out, the aquarium goes the other way, the fish falls into the water. The fish has never been in the water. Immediately freaks out, holds his breath, and doesn't know what to do, and so finally he, has, he can't hold on any longer. And he begins to breathe like a fish, not knowing that he could do that, but discovering that he can live in water. And all of a sudden, now think about this, from this point on, what is the fish committed to? The fish is committed to that which is his true environment, that which gives him life, what he was created to be in. For in, Paul says it this way, in him we live and move and have our being. So many people are afraid the world has turned us into fish that breathe out of water and we're afraid to go into the water because that's an unknown quantity for us. But when you get into the water, when you become born again, when you come to know God, you realize, oh, this is what I was created for. This is good. In this I live and breathe and, and I have, live and move and have my being. I was created to live in God. All of us were created to live in the environment of God and have God live in us. But fear has, is keeping many of us, perhaps we've stuck our toe in, but we're afraid to go all the way into God. And so we're not experiencing where we're supposed to be living. Our true environment is in Him. And outside of him, we're independent. Independence, if you want a quick definition of sin, it's independence from God. Independence in your thought life, independence in your words, independence in your emotions, in your actions, in your purposes in life. Anything that's independent from God isn't of God. Thus it's sin. And thus it has built into it corruption. And corruption doesn't come from God, it comes from the independence from God. And so anything that we choose that isn't in him is going to be birthed and have a default position of fear and loss, bondage. I don't care how good it looks. And some of the most, the most wealthy people and the most so-called successful people in the world, and we could start naming names that you know, Hollywood stars and athletes and what have you, are in bondage. Their lives are hollow, though they are successful, but they've not yet found their true environment. And many of them end up killing themselves because they can't live outside of what they're afraid of. Until we, are, we cease to be afraid of God and we realize, oh, this is where I'm supposed to be, we're never going to experience true life, abundant life. We're created for abundant life. If you want to know your true identity, you must know who your father really is. I've, I, we had a girl live with us once years ago that didn't know who her father was, and she was on this search uh, to find her biological father. And there are many people like that. They want to know their biological father, and I'm not saying that's wrong or right. I'm just saying it's more important to find out who your spiritual father is, to know him, to have a relationship with him so that there is no hole, there's no vacuum, there's nothing to fill because you're filled with the presence of God. And whether you know or don't know who your biological father is, the most important thing in this world is to know your father, Father God, and to not be afraid of him, and not be afraid of what that means to your life. 
And I think that's, that's one of the biggest fears that even Christians have. They will come to church and they will get involved in the routine and they will get involved in the, in the things that go on in church, but they're still, they're, the doors are still closed in their heart to really stepping in and knowing him. There's still that fear there. And then they wonder why prayer doesn't seem to work and why things still seem to go wrong and why God doesn't take care of all their problems and magically make them go away because there's no relationship. We haven't stepped in, we're not in him yet. And I'm not, I'm not saying you're not born again, I'm just saying there's, there's a place of being so in him and him in you that you're free from fear. You're free from fear. 1 John 4, 18. 1 John 4:18 says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. Again, I won't ask for hands, but I think many of you know what I'm talking about. Fear is torment, whether it's a financial fear, a physical sickness fear, a relationship fear, whatever, it's torment. Has anyone ever stayed up all night worrying about something? I have, yeah. Torment, torment. Now many times, you know, I try to turn that into a time of prayer <coughs> To go from the negative to the positive and, and expect God to give me wisdom and, and set me free from that torment. But anything that we are dwelling on, anything that we can't let go of, anything that is eating at us, it's because we don't know who our Father is. Let's just be blunt. Whenever we're walking in fear, we've forgotten who our Father is because perfect love casts out fear. See, I, like, I, I talk to myself the same way I'm talking to you, so I hope I'm not offending you. I'm not, but this is how I talk to myself. I get brutally honest, and I recognize these things, and I say, okay, Barry, you're in fear. If you're in fear, you're not perfected in love. If you're not perfected in love, it's because you don't know who God is. And I think, whoa, wait a minute, I'm the dean of students, I teach. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to be honest, I don't want to fake myself out. I want to be honest. Do I really know him? Why is there this fear in this area of my life? Okay, I need more of God in that part of my life. I, need, I want to be set free from this thing. Proverbs 28.1 says, The righteous are as bold as a lion. Now, if you read my book, I'll tell you my story about the revelation of righteousness. Righteousness set me free. When I understood righteousness, so many of my fears dissolved or, or were broken up to where they, they started coming, coming off. When I understood that I could stand before God without any guilt or condemnation or fear, and when I understood I could stand before the devil and sickness without fear, I got set free. When I understood what righteousness was, see, when I understood my Father, that He is righteous and He has gifted me with His righteousness, when I understood that, so many fears just disappeared. Now, I had to start growing into, into maturity in a number of areas, but I was no longer bound. I could grow because I saw righteousness. The righteous are as bold as a lion. I'm, I'm trying not to get ahead of myself here, but it says in Romans 8.15, Romans 8.15 says, For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Let's say that together. We have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. And, you, and I, we won't do it now, but do this. Keep saying this until it gets into your heart. I am not bound by fear. I refuse to be bound by fear. My father is not a father of fear. My father is love. And if there's still fear working in my life, then I don't know him well enough yet. Because I must be afraid of him to get right to the point. That's where it all goes back to. There's a fear of God. The second thing I want to talk to you about is a fear of your purpose. The first one is a fear of who your father is and a fear of identity, fear, an unhealthy fear of God. The second one is a fear of your purpose. I mentioned earlier, in this room, who knows the wealth of what God has invested in every heart 
he, seeing the end from the beginning, I know the thoughts that I have for you to give you an expected end. That's God. God sees things. It's interesting when God called Paul. Uh, I don't have the address for this right now. Paul is talking about his past. He says, I was injurious. I was a persecutor of the church. I was this. I was that. But God counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. And I thought, when I read that one day, I thought, huh? He counted you faithful? You're taking people to prison, probably to their deaths? And he counted you faithful? Because God wasn't looking at that Paul. God was looking at that Paul. He was looking at the future. He was looking at the expected end. He saw something in Paul that he saw, that's, that's my guy. That's my guy. In the middle of him chasing around my church, that's my guy. Or in other words, what we could say is in the middle of the failure that we would call failure, in the middle of, the, of, of, of this mess he's making of his life and other people's lives, still I can see that's my guy. And my point is, what's he see in you that you haven't seen or are unwilling to see? He has an expected end for you. Many of us are afraid of our purpose. What's your purpose? What's your purpose? Romans 8, 28. Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good, but there's caveats here. To them that love God, they're not afraid of God, and to them that are called according to his purpose. This isn't, well, you know, all things work together for good. Whatever will be, will be. No, that's not what this is saying. You have to love God, which means you're not afraid of him. And you're called according to his purpose. You're not afraid of your purpose. Then things tend toward the good in your life. But fear of God or fear of purpose will block that. How many of you believe you have a purpose? You are unique on this earth. You have something that no one else has. And you have, you're packaged in a way that the way that gift comes out of you, no one else can replicate that. You are you for a reason. The body of Christ needs you. The world needs you. Your family needs you. And if, until we understand that we have a purpose, if we're afraid of that purpose, then we're never going to live the abundant life. And fear is going to put us in bondage and entrap us, and we're going to, we're going to live a, a futile life of loss. Ephesians 2.10. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. There's an image. We talked about image last night. How many of you see yourself as his workmanship and that you are, you are all right? You're a fine piece of workmanship. Do you have that self-image that you're, you're good looking, <laughs> at least on the inside? Amen. <laughs> you're his workmanship. Now, let me, let me I'm going to tell on myself a little bit. Uh, I got born again when I was 20, but before that, in, in junior high, going, yeah, I think back probably junior high, I was in the Boy Scouts, and it, for some awards banquet, uh, I got a late call in the afternoon that I was, had the, the person that was going to give this certain award and make a speech, one of the other scouts could not be there, was sick or something, though they had picked me to make this speech and give this award. I said, no, that's not happening. It's like what I told Ken today about the water. I'm not jumping in the water. <laughs> it's not happening. And my dad says, oh, you can do it, you can do it. And I said, no, I'm not doing it. And he says, yes, you can do it. And he tried to coach me in all this. And no. So we drive up to the to the building where the awards bank was taking place. And I got out of the car, I walked in the front door, he turned left, I turned right, I went and I went to the quartermaster room and I got under rolls and rolls of tents, I hid under the tents <laughs> and no one could find me. And when it was finally over, my dad went back there looking, they didn't know where I was and I crawled out from under the tents. I was so petrified of public speaking, petrified. And so in junior high, they started making me take public speaking courses, which I hated. And I had to stand up and recite Casey at the Bat. You know, or I had to, I did Frank, Franklin Roosevelt's uh, Declaration of War against Japan, and I had hated that stuff. And then I got picked to be part of the school presentation, some school play, I was the moderator. And I had to walk out on stage in front of the whole junior high 
And so I had a cue, and the teacher is out there, and I'm off in the wings, and the teacher, I thought I saw the cue. And I, so I walked out on stage, and she stood here and said, Barry, you're too early, not yet, go back. And the whole place just erupted. And I thought, if I had a gun. <laughs> I know I'm too young, but. <laughs> And so I've had the, I, in other traumatic moments, public speaking, and yet when I got born again, shortly thereafter, I knew God was going to use me to share the word of God. I just knew it, but I was petrified. It was bondage to me. I was afraid of God. God, why did you pick me? Don't want to do that. And yet I made a decision that every time I got an invitation to say anything to anybody, I would say yes. I just made that decision. That was a hard decision, but I determined I am going to beat this. I refuse to live in fear. And so every time that I had an invitation to share anything, I didn't get many because obviously people could tell I didn't want to do it, <laughs> but they started growing over time, the invitations to share a testimony or share a word or a devotion or something like that, I would make myself do it. I don't know if you've seen uh, The Ghost of Mr. Chicken with Don Knotts, and he has to get up and give a speech at the picnic, city picnic or whatever, and, it's <laughs> and he knocks his water over and all that. That was me. I mean, that was me. And, yet, and that was a fear of my purpose because my purpose didn't fit my convenience. And yet I knew it's a God thing in me. You know, some of you know you've got something in you, but you're afraid to step into it. And I kept at it and kept at it and kept at it until today, the bigger the crowd, the better I like it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Because I, I, I broke through the bondage, and now God is using what I was afraid of to take care of my life, my wife, my kids, my grandkids. Because I broke through a fear, I don't know what I would have been doing had I refused to go through this fear. I, I, who knows what I would be doing for a living? I don't think it would have been very successful. <laughs> but I chose to embrace my purpose and defeat, and I'm not saying I defeated my own strength, but by the grace of God, I was able to recognize this as bondage and break through it by the grace of God. There's a story of a man who was a chicken rancher, and he was out walking in the fields one day, and he came across a baby eagle. How many have heard this one already? A few of you, okay. He finds this baby eagle, so he takes it back, doesn't know what to do, so he thinks, well, I'll leave this with my chickens, this eagle with my chickens, and per perhaps it can survive and it can learn to, to eat with the chickens or what have you. And so over time, the eagle begins to adapt to this environment of the chickens and imitates the chickens and eats like the chickens, walks like the chickens, moves its head like the chickens, uh, looking for bugs, looking for seeds on the ground, and it, it grows. But of course, it's obviously getting bigger than a chicken over time. And, uh, but it's, it's adapted to chicken life. One day, while it's eating bugs and seeds on the ground, it sees a tremendous shadow pass overhead on the ground. He sees a shadow and looks up. And the rooster runs over to the, chick, to the eagle and says, uh, what are you looking at? And the eagle says, what's that? And the rooster looks up and says, oh, that's an eagle. But don't give it another thought. You're a chicken, and you'll always be a chicken. <laughs> and the eagle went back to looking for seeds and bugs. And I thought, that is so relevant to so many Christians, that you were created to be an eagle, but you've settled for being a chicken. You've settled for the little bits that the world will give you you're always looking down at seeds and bugs, and yet you were created to soar. You were created with a purpose. You were created to do things that no one else can do. And you have a purpose, and that purpose is far beyond perhaps what, what you, you, perhaps you've seen it and you're afraid of it, or perhaps you haven't even seen it yet. But there's something inside of you that the body of Christ needs, that your marriage needs, that your family needs, that your workplace needs. They need you walking in your purpose. You are a walking, talking blessing if you would step into it, if you would embrace it. Can you do that? Say, oh, Barry, I don't know how. 
first you've got to recognize it. You've got to recognize it. I think I'm going to insert something here. The prodigal son, the prodigal son, he took off, and we know the story, and riotous living and what have you, and he finds himself living with pigs or eating what the pigs ate, or he wanted to eat what the pigs ate. He was at the bottom. He's not living the abundant life, all right? And the first thing it says, and when he came to himself, recognition. I hope tonight might be a night of recognition for some of you. When he came to himself, he said, my father's servants are doing better than I'm doing. I will go to my father, number two, repentance. Recognition, number one. Repentance, number two. Wow. And then it says, and he got up and went to his father. Recovery, number three. He didn't just repent in his mind and sit there. He got up and went to his father. Recognition of fear. Recognition that there are some fears. Recognition that maybe you can't do this or you don't want to do that or you're afraid of this or afraid of that. At least if you can come to a place of recognition tonight, at least we've made some progress. Now, are you willing to repent? They say, why do I need to repent? Because you're not walking with your father. You can't be in that bondage and tell me you have a good, healthy relationship with the father. So repent. Repent doesn't, it just means change your mind about the father. And then get up and go toward him and recover what you've lost. You have a purpose. Don't be afraid of your purpose. Fear binds us from purpose. We were created to soar. We weren't created to eat bugs. We are not chickens. Let's go to Psalms 34.4. Psalms 34.4. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. I'm telling you, relationship with God will deliver you from fear. Every time a fear comes up that you recognize, it's a warning sign. It's a warning sign that in some way you're not in a correct relationship with God. I'm not talking about he doesn't love you, you're not born again. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying you're not living the fullness of what he has for you. Every fear should be a warning sign. It should be a red flag. And every time we come up against a fear, we should say, okay, wow, I know what this is. I'm, I'm lacking in relationship here. I'm not experiencing the love of God in this area. I'm in bondage. Just be brutally honest. The more we disguise things and hide them, the less we're going to grow. Don't be afraid of your purpose. What's the dream that God's put in you that you've tried to snuff out? What's, what's the, the vision that you could have if you gave yourself enough time to think about it? but you drown it out with earphones or TV or you don't want to think about it. What's the thing that if, you, if there was no lack of resources, the thing that you would do that would bless other people? See, we, we let fear, the lack of resources, many times stop us from what God wants us to do. What vision has God put in your life that maybe you're unwilling to even look at because of fear? Let's go to Psalm 46. There's so many verses on this. I was looking at some this afternoon. There's just too many to read. Psalm 46, 1 and 2. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, I'll rearrange that, we will not fear, though the earth be removed, though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. We will not fear. I will not fear. See, these are things that if you say them now, if you declare these things now, if you make these decisions now, then it's a lot easier to deal with it when it pops up. But if you haven't made the decision now when it pops up, the temptation usually is stronger and you'll say, well, I'll give in again and be afraid. Make up your mind now. I will not fear my IAG public speaking. I will not fear my mission skit on the mission trip. I will not fear, I, and whatever the case may be, I refuse to fear. And say those things now. 
Just make some quality decisions now and then trust the grace of God that as you walk with him and talk with him and things like that come up, you, and you look at it and you say, well, I got that whipped. I whipped that six months ago. I'm prepared. I know. I can do this. I can do this. How many of you want to step into something new that you know God's put in your heart? Amen. I mean, this all of you probably. Third thing I want to mention is, I'm not sure I like the way I've written it here, but I'll, I'll just go ahead and read it that way. The fear of stepping out of your box. The fear of stepping out of your box. We lived in uh, Guatemala and back in 1989. We went to Guatemala for 10 months to learn Spanish, and then from there we went to Chile. We were in Chile almost 12 years uh, as missionaries. And so these 10 months in Guatemala, we lived very rustically, we'll say. Very, very, very rustically. And it was a kind of the thing where you have to walk to the market every day and uh, that kind of thing. So anyway, uh, I love popcorn. Anybody here love popcorn? Okay, I love popcorn. And so I would make popcorn. Um, and typically, I don't let any get away. Uh, <laughs> right, popcorn. And so uh, on this one occasion, apparently, I, one, one escaped. And so we had gone to the market. We were walking back. We opened the front door to what I'll call our house. <laughs> Adobe thing with no running water. And uh, we walk in to we'll call the living room. And I'm, I look on the floor, and I see a piece of popcorn. And it's twirling. It's going in circles. And I thought to myself, I've never seen this before. This, I need to look closer. Is this magic popcorn? And so I look down at this popcorn, and there are five little black ants under this popcorn, all holding up part of it, and they're all following each other. <laughs> no telling how long they had been there, just going in circles. And I'm not making this up. There was an ant on top. <laughs> and I thought, he's got to be the leader. <laughs> and I can just hear the little ant voices. You're doing great, guys. Go, go, go. <laughs> and I'm watching this, and I'm thinking, oh, this is amazing. What a message there is here. All these little ants just following each other, just going in circles, thinking they're going somewhere, and the leader encouraging them on. No time at all. We'll be there. I, I, I watched that for I don't know how long, and then finally I... <laughs> 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 put them out of their misery. But I got a good message illustration out of it. They gave their lives for a good cause. But I thought, how many of us live lives of routine, and I'm a routine guy, but I'm not afraid to break up the routine when God calls me somewhere. I won't tell all my stories about that. But I'm not against routine. But if you're unwilling to step outside the box, if you're only going to follow the ant in front of you your whole life, and you're only going to go in circles your whole life, and you're never going to step into the promises of God and the purpose of God, you're afraid of knowing him too much. You're afraid of what he might call you to do. Well, in him you live and move and have your being, number one. Number two, you're an eagle, not a chicken. And number three, let go of the popcorn. <laughs> There's a whole world out there. But if we're only going to hold on to the popcorn and just go in circles, we'll never know what God has for us. I've let go of the popcorn many times. That's what got me where I am today. Yeah. I'll tell, I'll, how much time do I have? As much as I want? <laughs> I don't want everybody to go, oh man. But uh, we, we came back from the mission field in 2001 went to Dallas. My son was there, and I think both my sons were there at that time. And we, uh, I had to get a job because no one threw open their doors of ministry to me and, and said, Barry, here you go, paying job, ministry, go. I'd been a missionary for 12 years, pastor for eight of those years, and I came back to nothing, basically. 
So I had to get a job. So I got a job in a, in a multi-level marketing um, company that sells uh, energy bars, energy vitamins, drinks, pills, all this kind of stuff. And I, but I wasn't in the multi-level part of it. I was in the warehouse. And so I was doing physical labor. And in the beginning, the first year, we were working 12 hours a day, six days a week. It was brutal because the company was exploding. It was brutal. And so I still had a vision in my heart. I'm a minister. I'm not a, I'm not a vitamin box packer I'm a, and a truck loader. I'm not that, I mean, I'm doing that to provide, but that's not who I am. And so I was willing to step out of the routine and approach my manager and I, I said, would it be possible to have a Bible study for the employees? Now see, I had to get over a little hump of fear there. I mean, that's a little dangerous in some companies. He says, I would love that. I'll give you an extra 30 minutes once a week. You can have an hour lunch and anybody that wants to come can go for the hour and listen to your Bible study. Praise God. See, I was willing to let go of the popcorn of just being an employee because I'm a minister. I know who I am. I know who my father is. I know what my purpose is and it's not just to load trucks and put boxes, put vitamins in boxes. And so people came to that and we did that for about a year and a half. Had a very successful Bible study in a secular business. And then I go to my pastor. I'm in a Spanish church in Dallas. I wasn't done with Spanish ministry yet. It was a church of about a thousand. So I go to him after about a year of being in the church and I said, would you consider a Spanish Bible college? He said, Barry, tell me, show me what you're thinking. And I had already had it all lined out. I had, I mean, God had given me a, a Bible college in my, and I had written it all out. He says, I love it. Do it. Carte blanche. Do whatever you want to do. Praise God. So a Bible study turned into a Bible college. I had a Bible college in Spanish for five years, uh, nighttime Bible college, much like what goes on here and Saturdays and all. And I graduated, averaged 50, sometimes up to 80 students a year, but I graduated over 200 students in five years. And then the Lord called us to Colorado. I let go of that popcorn. See, I'm not afraid to embrace my future, even when my future doesn't have a clear into it. And so I moved to Colorado and my wife had a, some of you've heard all this, but my wife had a job and we went up there and checked it out and no one knew us, but we took applications, mailed them in. Uh, they called my wife, they didn't call me and uh, said, we have an accounting job. If you'd like to come up for an interview, uh, we'll see if, if you fit for this accounting job. And uh, what about my husband? Well, no, I mean, we don't need him. And so, <laughs> So, I, but, but when we were up there, I got a word from God. When we went up there to check things out, I got a word from God. One day you will teach here. Wow. One day you will teach here. I didn't know what that meant. No one knows me. I'm, I work in a warehouse. Based on the job opportunity and a word from God, we, we stopped our life in Dallas, loaded everything in a truck, rented a, an apartment over the phone, drove up to Colorado Springs. She did her interview. She got the job. I got nothing. Two weeks go by, I'm driving home, I dropped her off at work, I'm driving back to our apartment and she, I get a phone call, Barry, would you like to work in the phone center and pray for people over the phone? Now here's what I didn't say. I didn't say, no, God told me I was gonna teach. I think I should be a teacher. I didn't say that, because that would have been the last conversation we ever had. I said, yes, I can pray for people. I can, I can let go of the popcorn. I mean, I've already let go of the popcorn. I can pray for people on the phone. And I began in the phone center. Now all this is relative to fear. I'm in my mid fifties at this time, starting from the bottom again. I said, I, I mentioned that to God. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, I, I, this is a liberal conversation I had with God. I said, I, I was, I think 55 at the time. And I said, God, you know that by the time anyone sees that I have anything to offer, I'll be 58. And he says, Barry, you're going to be 58 anyway. <laughs> okay. So I get this job in the phone center. I do that for four months. Then they recognize I have a, a writing gift. And so they move me over into the, what is the, called the correspondence department, which was me. I was the whole department. And I answered all the emails that came in 
to Andrew. People were writing Andrew with all their questions, all their complaints, all their, every, anything that came into Andrew, I got it, I answered it. Did that for two and a half years. I answered over 20,000 letters and emails. I got very good at it. And after a year and a half of that, more or less, I got a phone call that changed my life. I was driving to work with my wife. She worked in accounting. We're at the corner of Centennial and Garden of the Gods. <laughs> at a red light, my cell phone rings, and I get, I get the phone call that changed my life. Because I hadn't been afraid to leave Chile. I hadn't been afraid to leave Dallas. I hadn't been afraid to start as a phone minister. I had, <laughs> I had broken through the fear barrier, and now I'm about to find my destiny. And the phone call was, Barry, can you speak at chapel in 10 minutes? <laughs> and I, very quick prayers were going up and down. <laughs> and I thought, if I say no, I may never get another chance. Yes, I would be happy to. What did I just say? Now, I'm not making this up. Other than the Bible study, I had not stood before a crowd and ministered in English in 18 years. Only Spanish. I didn't have any English notes. I ran into my office at work. I grabbed something out of my, my Spanish Bible notes. I had three folders there. I grabbed uh, the lesson I now teach about Job, eight differences between Job and a New Testament Christian. I ran in, mic'd up. Nobody knew who I was. My notes are in Spanish. I have to do it as I'm going into English. And that, see, not being afraid to say yes changed my life. They invited me back eight or nine more times that year. The following year, they gave me nine courses to develop and teach while I'm still doing the letter writing. So I'd be writing emails, run over, teach, run, run back, write more emails. The following year, they had me, they hired me full time in the college, gave me, I had the nine courses, they probably added three more than I had 12. I was, I became the head of the third year program. The following year, they asked me to be the dean of students. I'm now teaching 16 and a half or 17 courses in the school because I chose to ignore fear. See, you don't know what God has in store for you as long as you say, ah, no, I don't think I can do that. How many of you have destinies that are just incredible, but because of fear? Fear of knowing God, fear of your purpose, fear of breaking the routine, and we're not enjoying all the blessings of God. I'll stop there. I want to pray with you, all right? Hallelujah. Father, we want to be honest before you right now and recognize where we've allowed fear to shape our lives. Fear of knowing you, of what that might mean, and yet you are where we live and move and have our being. We only have life in you. Why are we afraid of you? Fear of what you may call us to do, and yet what you call us to do will be the joy of our hearts. We will love it more than we love what we're doing independently of you. Fear of breaking up the routine. Fear of changing things because it's unknown. Lord, I know you're speaking to hearts right now. People are recognizing areas where they've allowed fear to be their Lord and keep them in bondage. And Father, we just declare now, and I'm declaring on behalf of everyone here, enough, enough, we're done. No more fear, no more fear. In the name of Jesus, we're taking back our lives from the one that has come to steal, kill, and destroy. Perfect love casts out fear. And Father, we determine to know you in a way we've never known you before and to allow your love to invade every part of our lives, every part of our being, every relationship, everywhere we have influence in family or, or work, 
We're going to let the love of God cleanse us from all fear. And Lord, we're not going to be afraid to, to say yes to new opportunities. We're not going to be afraid to manage success because you're going to make everything we put our hand to prosper. And we're not going to be afraid of that. We're going to, we're going to step into everything you've called us to do, everything you've called us to be, because that's what brings blessing to the world. That's what releases your favor, your, your blessing, your power into the earth, is if we say yes instead of no. And I, just, I see a room full of people right now, Father, that are getting a vision of a life free from fear. And Lord, I speak your blessing over their hearts and minds now, that this wouldn't just be a moment of emotion, but this would be a quality decision that when they leave tonight, there would be decisions being made that they would take up, their, take up the, the challenge to step out of bondage into freedom and to enjoy the blessings and promises of God. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you, we bless you, we give you the praise in the powerful, the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Praise God. Uh, I want to talk to you about how to see, first of all, how to recognize the blessings of God in your life and then how to see them multiplied. Anybody interested in that? Yes. You know, the blessing, we, we are so blessed. So let's go to Ephesians 1.3. Ephesians 1.3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ. How many of you believe you've been blessed? See, we can read this. Now, again, if this doesn't create an image or a vision on the inside of you, then it's, it's just a, a nice verse. But if we can get to the place where we can begin to see, and I think most of us were, were deficient in recognizing the blessings of God. And if you can't recognize the blessings that are working in your life right now, it's going to be hard to see future blessings. But we have been blessed. The way I like to talk about grace, I have to make things into simple illustrations so that I get it. Uh, and hopefully you'll get it too. But the blessings of God, I, I consider that the raw material of everything we need in the kingdom. Everything we need, spirit, soul, and body, everything has been provided for us by what Christ accomplished on the cross. We are blessed. This says we've been blessed with all blessings. But I see it as, as, as raw material in a sense. And the one way I, under, I can think about it, we talk about grace. What is that? Well, grace is God's provision for every need that you have, spirit, soul, and body. There is nothing in your life that falls outside of what was accomplished on the cross. It's funny, I write posts about healing and things like this on Facebook, and people will write me and say, well, Barry, it sounds, sounds good, but if you knew my problem, if you knew my story. Wow. And I write back and I say, oh, explain to me how your, your situation got forgotten. How, how, Jesus forgot your situation when he was on the cross. Yours is outside of the cross. That's very interesting. Tell me more about that. You know, how did, how did your situation become so special that Jesus didn't take care of it? See, we need to understand that I don't care how special you think your situation is, it got nailed to the cross. Amen. It got taken care of by the blood of Jesus. Everything that you're going through in life, you've been blessed, at least with the raw material, to see that situation taken care of. If I have a, a grandson who's five and he, he's into trucks. He's not really into Legos yet, but I'm going to say he's into Legos. He'll get there. Uh, I, think, I think I'm not into Legos as a thing. It's, they're too tiny. Anyway, but if, if, if I were to lift up the roof of his bedroom and dump 10 tons of Legos, every size, shape, and color, into his bedroom. There would be enough Legos there to do anything he wanted to do. But what's the, dis the, the determining factor from that point on? Everything he needs to build anything he wants is in that room. But it now is up to him 
up to his vision, up to his initiative, up to whatever he wants. He can, up to his creativity. God has blessed us with everything we need. The raw material, if you can bear with that, that term with me, the raw material of everything you need has been dumped on us through Jesus. And now it's basically according to the power that worketh in us. My favorite verse, people have asked me, Ephesians 3.20, now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly more than we can ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. And so whatever you need for your life, it already exists. But the problem for most of us is that, first of all, we don't recognize blessings. We don't even know how to quantify blessings. Every good thing in your life had a source. Every good thing in your life has a source. It came from the giver of good things. It came from God. His mercy, his grace, his reign falls on the just and the unjust. So even, even the unjust have good things in their lives many times, but they don't recognize the source. But it's tragic when Christians don't recognize the source. The people in your life are a blessing. You may say, you don't know them. No, you're not seeing with the right eyes. It's the vision problem. Go back and listen to the other message last night. The people in your life are a blessing. Your spouse is a blessing. Okay, I'm watching faces. <laughs> your job is a blessing. Say, so you don't know my boss. You don't. No, see, you're looking at it with the wrong eyes. The fact that you have a job, there's a lot of people that would love to have a job. You have one. Your, the roof over your head is a blessing. The food you eat is a blessing. The food I ate today was a blessing. It's going to be a blessing until probably tomorrow night. <laughs> uh, everything, the clothes that we wear, is, they're blessings. The paycheck is a blessing. But if we don't recognize and if we quantify things with natural eyes and say this isn't enough, or this is not a blessing, this is a curse, the way we approach the blessings of God is going to determine whether or not they have the opportunity to multiply in our lives. Everything in you is a potential blessing. The gifts that you have in you, the love that you have in you can be a blessing to someone else. The capacity to forgive is a blessing. The capacity to give is a blessing. Those are the two major natures of God, giving and forgiving. Amen? The capacity to, to serve, to help, to sacrifice. All of these things are blessings, but we, we typically go through life, and I'm, I'm not trying to point the fingers, this is just generic statements that include me, but we go through life ignorant many times of God's blessings. Or we're looking at them in, with natural eyes and thinking this isn't enough. So I'm not blessed. And we're not seeing the raw material of the all blessings, we're just seeing in the natural the apparent limitations of the right now blessings. And so we don't even call them blessings. So until we can learn to recognize that every good thing in your life has a source, you're always going to be working at a deficit. Who's the source? God is the source. God gives you the air that you breathe. You know, I was thinking about hell the other day. I uh, don't want to go there. But I was trying to understand because, well, I'm writing, I'm writing lessons on this and all, but hell is basically what people desire without knowing it. They desire independence from God, and hell is ultimate independence. It's just ultimate independence. Everything that God has given that we, we refuse to acknowledge, we refuse to acknowledge the air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we eat, the houses we have, the love we give and receive. We refuse to acknowledge that. We refuse to acknowledge the source. We prefer independence. This is a generic we of lost people. We want to be independent from that, with not knowing that independence from the source is hell. And ultimately, that will be the harvest of those people. They will be forever independent of God. There will be nothing good because he's the source of all good. And so until we can understand that I am blessed, I am blessed. 
if I, if I only had one set of clothes and only had a tent or not even a tent, nonetheless, until I learned to recognize that I am a living being created in the image of God who he loves with his infinite eternal love, start there. That's a blessing. God loves you. He doesn't have to love you. But God has chosen to love you and to give his son for you. And we need to learn to start being thankful for what we have and recognize the blessings of God. Recognize that we have 24 hours in a day. Recognize that we have the opportunity to give. I, I share this in another message, but I'll throw it in here. That I, lo I love the movie Groundhog Day. I watched it again the other night. And because Phil, the weatherman, how many know what I'm talking about? Okay. Phil, the weatherman, is, gets stuck in a time loop of the same day, and he lives the same day over and over. And I think I, I studied this out, and somebody decided that it was about like 10 or 15 years that he had to be in this to accomplish all the things he accomplished. But every day is the same with the same cast of characters, the same circumstances, the same everything. And yet, in his case, every day comes out different because of the way he approaches it. Or it's his attitude that determines how the day ends. See, and he goes through all these series of emotions and, and all kinds of stuff until finally he comes to a place of wanting to be a giver. And when he learns to be a giver, and he starts caring more about others than himself. Finally, the time loop breaks and he moves on with his life. But I thought, man, there, there is so much there. But you begin to recognize that you are a blessing. See, that's, that's a big leap for some of us. Say it, I'm a blessing. I'm a blessing. See, be, when you begin to see that you are a blessing, to the people that you give love to and that people that give love to you. You are a blessing to your employer who you can choose to bless every day with your attitude. You are a blessing because you have skills that other people don't have. You have ideas that other people don't have. My son, my second son, Daniel, works in uh, the school now. He's the assistant dean of education and he's been put over all kinds of things dealing with our schedule. Our schedule is like rocket science. It's really complicated. We have three years. In the third year, we have seven tracks. We have umpteen million speakers coming through, and he has to organize all that. It is, I don't know how he does it. But in that, he has become so creative that he is basically, the first two years have been transformed by how we do school, how these courses are arranged, what the students get to do now they didn't used to get to do, all kinds of things. He is a blessing to that school. I don't think he even realizes how much because he came in with creativity, with gifting, and he has chosen to be a blessing rather than just hold on to the popcorn and get a paycheck. All of you can make those choices. Creativity is a blessing. New ideas can be a blessing. The way you present them, you know, with humility would help, but they can be, they can be a blessing. Until we learn to recognize our blessings. When I pull out of the driveway every morning, I leave in the dark, I leave the house at six, and uh, I have a 45, 50 minute drive up the hill. But I, the whole way up, I am thanking God for my family. I'm thanking God for my house. I am thanking God for my cars. I am thanking God for everything he's given me. Thanking God for Andrew, who has opened up the world to me, uh, the platform that has been given to me. I, I am so thankful. Now, do I have problems? Do I have challenges? Are there things I would change? Yeah, absolutely. There are things I would change and things I, I'm not happy with. But I stop and I think, wait a minute. I work in the best place in the world. I work in the best ministry in the world. I have an opportunity to touch the world, literally. These videos go around the world. So I think, okay, I'm not going to complain. There's a, there's a blessing there. There's a blessing Learn to recognize your blessings. A blessing can be a person who encourages you. Do you ever thank God for the people that come up to you and bless you and pray for you? I've gotten blessed a lot tonight and last night. People coming up and just telling me how they've been blessed blesses me. I, I recognize that. Those are blessings in my life. A blessing is an opportunity to use your gifts. It's the air you breathe, the roof over your head, the, your spouse, your children, your friends, your resources. It's everything that you receive. It's everything that you can give. It's something you were born with. 
something God has put in you when you got born again. James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom is no change or shadow of turning. Or in other words, God is the source of every good thing, but if you don't recognize it as a good thing, it's limited. And it can't reproduce. It can't multiply. You've got to recognize good things. You have seen things others have not seen. You know things that others don't know. You have experiences that others haven't had. You have something to give. You have something that people need. But if you don't recognize it, if you're unwilling to, to see, get that image on the inside that I can be a blessing. I can be a blessing. See, this is where I've stepped out of the, the fear, world of fear and into the world of I'm going to be who God has made me to be. I used to compare myself with other preachers and think, oh, man, I, I quit. I can't, I'm not, I can't preach like that. And I can't, I don't know as much as this guy knows. And, and I just, I would get all down on myself until I realized, wait a minute, they can't be like me. I'm unique. Nobody can be like me. I'm me. I get to be me. I get to be me. <laughs> One time my wife told me, she says, it must be fun being you. So, it is. It's great. It's great. And though I'm not like others, I'm just like me. I'm like what God wants me to be like. And, and, and what that did was it set me free to be me and to share what I have. And then people come up to me and they say, Barry, I just love your teaching. And I'm thinking, man, I mean, that, it, that blesses me. That's a blessing. I got to give something that blessed somebody. And the more I do that, the more I hear that. And then that just encourages me to do it more. And then I hear it more. And I think, man, th this, is, this is living. Mm -hmm. This is good. I want to recognize the blessings of other people in my life, and I want to recognize the blessings God has given me to give them. Amen. And I want to be thankful for that. Rather than seeing your past as a liability, see it as something that can bless others. Anybody here have a past? <laughs> a couple of you, okay. Uh, anybody ever seen your past as a po possible liability? Yeah? Okay. I... I was uh, asked to leave college in my senior year. And my wife always says, Barry, don't tell that story. And I said, you know what? I'm not ashamed of that. Uh, I mean, I was so turned on to God and I got turned off to school and I, my grades suffered and uh, I got asked to leave in the middle of my senior year. And yet, I tell it, not because I'm proud of it, but I'm proud of God because in spite of that, which we could look at as a failure in a sense, I choose to use it as a blessing to show people you don't have to be limited by your past. You don't have to be limited by your past. Now we've got students in school that have been to prison, we've got students that have been drug addicts, we've got students that have been married multiple times, we have everything in the room. And they don't have to be limited by that and they get a vision that they're blessed and they can be a blessing. Are you recognizing your blessings? When we complain about our lack, what we have loses the power to multiply. When you complain about what you don't have, you're losing the power of multiplication. The grace lifts off that thing because you're looking at it with natural eyes. When you look at your, I can say, well, look at my education. I don't have enough. I can't be a teacher or I can't be a dean of students because I flunked out of college. Uh, when I, if you quantify it that way, then that's where you're going to live. But once I realized I have a story, I have a life story, I have a testimony, I have a transformed life. Therefore, what that could be an anchor to my life now has become a blessing in the sense that I can share it to encourage other people. I'm using my past to be an encouragement, to be a blessing. And if you would look at your past and say, how can I bless somebody with the wisdom that I gleaned from this situation and start using it as a blessing, it becomes a seed that can multiply. 
Everything in your life, every experience can be turned into a seed that can bless somebody and multiply back to you. Go with me to Psalm 67, 5 and 6. Psalm 67, 5 and 6. It says, I want everybody to look at it. Look at this. this. This is good stuff. Psalm 67, 5 and 6. It says, Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. Listen. Then shall the earth yield her increase, and God, even our own God, shall bless us. Did you hear that? Let the people praise thee. Praise unlocks the abundance of the earth and the blessing of God. You want to know why things aren't going well, maybe? You're not giving thanks. Give thanks for what you have. Recognize the blessings you have and give thanks. And learn to praise God for everything. I mean, you may not like your house, but you have one. You may not like your car, but you have one. <laughs> You may not like your wardrobe or your food or, or even your spouse, but you have one. <laughs> I used to get letters when I worked for Andrew in the correspondence department. I'd get letters. It was something, I tell you what. People would say, why won't God give me a spouse? I want a spouse. I have to get married. I, you know, this and then on and on and on. And then the next letter I'd read was, is it okay if I divorce my wife? I'm so sick. <laughs> Think, okay, I'm going to give you her email address. Because <laughs> some people can't stand their marriage and other people can't wait to get married. Neither one of them is seeing the blessing of their current situation. They're just seeing what they think they lack. And until we begin to praise God for what we have, I praise God. I tell you, my marriage... And it wasn't a bad marriage, and my wife wasn't doing anything wrong. It's not that. It was I had selfishness in my heart. And when I, when I broke through that and began to see my purpose is to bless her, that's it. I'm on this earth to bless my wife. And in blessing my wife, not only did my marriage get super better, but more doors opened for me in ministry Amen. because the selfishness in my heart got broken. And I began to, as Jesus, lay down my life for the bride. I tell you what, when you become thankful, things change. It's an image. It's a vision on the inside. When you get excited about what you have, no matter how lacking it seems to be, you get excited about it. You praise God for it. Praise God for 15 cents in the bank account. Thank you, Father. I mean, one time I was down to the equivalent of a dollar or two dollars in Mexico one time. And I was at church, and I, long story, but anyway, I thought, what can I do? I, I, I want to give something to the Lord. And the Holy Spirit says, well, give it all. This isn't going to help you. So, <laughs> so I gave it all. So now I have nothing. I gave everything I had left into the offering at church that night. And I thank God, praise God. This is going to be fun to see how this works out. The next day, I got something I never got before. I got a check in the mail. That had never happened before. You know how we always say, well, the check's in the mail. It was never in the mail. <laughs> the spider was in the mailbox, but there was no check. <laughs> I went to the mailbox the next day. The check was in the mail. Not anything I was expecting. Someone, the least, last person on earth, I was 50 bucks, which was enough to get us back to Texas in that, that day <laughs> in a Volkswagen. But, I, but see, when you get thankful, when you get thankful for what you have, the earth gives its increase and God releases blessings. Amen. It, that is good. That has transformed me. Thank you, Father, for the opportunities I have. Thank you for the situations. Thank you when... Greg Moore, the director, gives me 17 more things to do. Thank you, Father. <laughs> Praise God, I can do it. It's, but see, thankfulness is an attitude based upon a vision, an image on the inside. I want to show you something. I teach this in other lessons, and uh, 
I'm going to throw it in again tonight. You may have heard this. Go with me to Mark 8. If I don't follow my notes, it's okay. You don't know. <laughs> Mark 8, verse 5. I was reading this one day, and the Lord stopped me. Now, let me read it to you first. It's the loaves and the fishes. And he asked them, how many loaves have ye? And they said seven. In this case, it was seven. And he commanded the people to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves and gave thanks and break and gave to his disciples to set before them. And they did set them before the people. And he had a few small fishes and he blessed and commanded, the, and commanded to set them also before them. So they did eat and were filled and they took up of the broken meat that was left seven baskets. And I read that just like I read that just now. And like many of us read it, we read over it and keep going. And the Lord stopped me and he says, Barry, you just read over the secret of abundance. The secret of prosperity. Are you interested? Yes. Yay, Lord. <laughs> read it again. How many loaves have you? And they said, seven. In other words, and in other stories, we, he says, what do you have? And they say, we only have. They were gauging this by their natural perception of thousands of people and limited resources. They were done. I'm sure they were thinking, we'll show him. We don't, I mean, send them off to get something to eat. There's not enough here. What do you have? Look, we only have seven loaves. It's enough for maybe us. Every time we look at our natural resources as not enough, we are limiting the power of multiplication. Jesus said, and he commanded the people to sit down on the ground. In another story, give them to me. And he took the seven loaves, and now the Holy Spirit is really working in my heart because I'm looking for this. What is this key to prosperity? And he took the seven loaves and he gave thanks. And I thought, ah, ha, ha. He gave thanks, number one. I'm going to give you three things here. He gave thanks. And I thought, we just read over that like we bless our food. You know? No, this is something dynamic. This is something deeper than just thank you. He gave thanks. Thank you, Father, that I have something to work with. I have something. There's something in my marriage. There's something in my kids. There's something to work with. It looks limited. It may look like not enough. It may look like it's a lost cause, but I have something. Become thankful for what you have. Become thankful for your job. Become thankful for your, your boss. You say, well, you don't know. It doesn't matter. If you become thankful, it will change or God will get you into a new place. But you've got to get thankful. He gave thanks for what he had. So that was the first key. That's what I'm talking about mostly in this message. It's just thankfulness. And then it says, And he took the seven loaves and gave thanks and break and gave to his disciples to set before them, and they did set them before the people. And he says, that's number two. I said, what? He used what he had. He put it to work. He put it to work. What looked like not enough, he put it to work. Where did the multiplication take place? How did it take place? The invisible became visible, but it happened because of thankfulness and the willingness to put it to work. What do you have right now that you're not using? And I'm not talking about stuff in the house, though that could include that, but giftings, mental capacity, emotional stuff that you could, you could bless people with a hug. What do you have that you're not using? Put what you have to work. Quit looking at it as not enough. It can bless somebody. There were days on the mission field when 50 cents would have been a big blessing. What do you have? And, people, and here's what happens is the people in the states that you know, could have supported us would say, well, I only have $5. I can't, that won't bless him. Oh, man, that would have blessed my socks off, $5. See, we always think we don't have enough. And so we don't put it to work because we're looking at it with natural eyes and not with spiritual eyes. Be thankful for what you have and then put it to work. Use it because it's seed that carries the nature of the source, which is your heart. And if the source of your heart is thankful, the seed carries the power of God. Praise him and then the earth shall give her increase and God our God will bless us. 
set it, set it to work, but with a thankful heart. Thankfulness will turn it into power. It will turn it into power. Whatever you have, you can, you can sow it, and it will become powerful in your future. Praise God. So he gave it to his disciples to set before them, and they just set them before the people. In verse 7, they had a few small fishes, and he blessed. And he said, that's number three. He blessed. I think, okay, what, what? And then it dawned on me. Most of us <coughs> curse what we have. This stupid car. This stupid bill. This stupid wife. These dumb kids. This boss of mine. And constantly, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And many of us, without even knowing, we're cursing our present and our future with our words because we aren't thankful. If you can become thankful and begin to use what you have with thankfulness and then bless it as it goes out. See, that's what I do when I, drive, when I go to work every day and come back every day. I'm blessing. I'm blessing my wife. I'm blessing my kids. I'm blessing my grandkids. I'm blessing their resources. I'm blessing my resources. I'm blessing my car. I'm blessing my stuff. I'm blessing my ministry. I'm speaking blessing. I'm speaking life. I'm speaking multiplication. I'm speaking words because it's not because I'm religious and I have a fear at all. It's because I know the power of words that come from a thankful heart. And I can bless you can bless. You can bless this school. You can bless your leaders. You can bless your family. You can speak. Can you imagine what would happen if the whole body of Christ in the world began to speak words of life and blessing and thanksgiving? We'd change the world really quickly. But most of us are busy complaining, backbiting, having strife, being unthankful, seeing everything as too little. And yet the word says we have been blessed with every blessing. The raw material of your abundant life is fully available to you. But if your attitude is one of, I don't have enough, this will never be enough, it will never be enough because you just prophesied it. Three keys to prosperity then. Thankfulness, using what you have, and blessing what you have. So I want to give you three dimensions real quick. I'm, I'm running out of time here. So three dimensions of blessings, or three dimensions of, yeah, three dimensions of blessings. Let's look at that which has been done, that which can be done, and that which will be done. Past, present, future. We have been blessed. Got to get a vision of that. Got to get a vision of your health has been provided for. Your long life has been provided for. Your purpose has been provided for. The uniqueness of your life, it's all there. Everything is there. You have been blessed. Now, are you going to walk in it? The raw material of your life is all there for you. When I look at, when I look at Christians, and I, I get to see many in school and in my travels and in my life, I realize that the blessings of God aren't automatic. If they were automatic, we would all be the same. The minute a need arose, the grace of God would make it go away. Right? I've noticed that doesn't happen. We're all in different places with different resources and different capacities, and not all of our needs just disappear. And so I realized, though we have all been blessed, there must be some key to release the blessings of God, the grace of God in our lives. And so my, my goal as a teacher is to help Christians discover how to release God's blessings into their life. What I'm sharing tonight is huge. Thankfulness is number one. Just recognizing the blessings of God and being thankful, then putting them to work, and then blessing everything that you do. Blessing, 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 blessing. Blessing every person that speaks ill of you. Bless per people that backbite. Bless people that that have an emotional blow up at you, just bless them, bless them. Bless your wife, that'll surprise her. It's a joke. That's a shame when I have to tell you when to laugh, but anyway. Bless your kids, bless, bless, just, just start blessing everything. It is the past tense that makes the present and the future possible. 
the past, what was accomplished on the cross, then makes your present and your future possible. So let's look at the present real quick. Galatians 3.9. Galatians 3.9. It says, So then they which be of faith are blessed. Present. They which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. How do you stay in faith? You be thankful. The quickest way to slide out of faith and end unbelief is to be cranky. Be thankful. Be thankful because it says, they which be of faith. So sometimes I just play with the words, I change them, but they which are thankful, they which recognize the goodness of God, the source, they which are excited, they which bless, they which use what they, use what, what, what they have. They are blessed with faithful Abraham. Abraham, it says in Romans 4, he was fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform. Are you fully persuaded? Do you have a vision on the inside of you that God cannot let you down? He is obligated to bless you. See, do you have that vision on the inside? If you don't, then it's not going to work for you. It's not going to be real for you. But if you see God as chomping at the bit to bless you, yes. to heal you, He's more excited about it than you are. Yeah. But if we have this tiny little God that he, he must be a mad scientist and we're just lab rats and he's just playing with me and I don't know if he's going to heal me or not. And all this theology, this garbage that has bound people up so long. If we could break free from that and see that God is excited about, he's already given you everything, all the raw material is there. Now if you just walk in faith, the present would be blessed. Just be thankful. Just see it. See the source. Thank him. Thank you, God, that I have 25 bucks in the bank. Praise God with that $25, that is seed. I'm going to turn it into $250,000 by the grace of God because I'm going to change the way I see it and sow it. I'm going to put it to work and bless it as it goes out. And you start walking like that, the sky's the limit. God's not your enemy. He's, he's got all those spiritual laws in place for them to work on your behalf. If you'd get thankful, it would all turn on. So we have present blessings if we're faith, walking in faith. Number three, real quick, future blessings. Let's do James 125. James 125. James 125 says, But whoso looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, I don't have time to expand all of that, but just walking in the freedom that Christ has given you. Be not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. Putting to work what you have. This man shall be blessed. Future. Shall be blessed. Or in other words, the blessings of God are of the present and the future exist because of the past. Because of the cross. Because of what Jesus accomplished. And he says... Be thankful, the earth will open up and be, begin to increase. Doors will open for you. God will bless you. Put it to work. Use what you have. <coughs> Use what you have. Put it to work. Bless it. And everything you put your hand to shall prosper. That's what I say about now. And See, I, this, is, this is a long time coming for me. My first years on the mission field, I wish I had known what I know now. Amen. We went through some tough times. Slept on the floor for six months. Couldn't buy tennis shoes for the kids because little tennis shoes for kids cost a hundred bucks. I mean, it was inflation city, and it was it was tough. I didn't know all of this back then. We just persevered. But man, what I know now, and understand, I I speak blessing. Every uh, I have favor, like Lawson says, Lawson Purdue. I have favor with God and man. Life isn't fair. I have favor. <laughs> I like that. I like that. I have favor. I am blessed. I, I, I have blessed times with people that I'm doing business with. I just expect to get blessed. I expect people to treat me nice, and they do. I don't expect to have conflict with other people. I don't expect that kind of thing. I expect blessing. I expect good relationships. I expect opportunities. I expect good things to find me. I expect good things to come to my house. Goodness and mercy are following me all the days of my life. Amen. See, that's my image on the inside. If you didn't get that lesson last night, go back and hear it. you got to have the right image. Then you have the right attitude. You get thankful. 
then you have the, the faith to use what you have, and then you can see it with spiritual eyes, and you can bless it, and you know oh, it's going to be a good tomorrow. It's going to be a good tomorrow. And then I talked about in due season last night. Harvests come in seasons, and sometimes they come when you really need them. And I had a miracle with my son in due season because of an attitude of thankfulness. How many of you are thankful? How many of you want to be more thankful? Amen. Praise God. We've got to see him as the source who is worthy of all of our praise and quit looking at the, what we perceive as limitations and limited resources and begin to see them as infinite potential. And if we would just give thanks for them, use them, and bless them as they go out, our lives would just transform. I, I know it. I'm living it. I'm living it. You can live it too. A lot of you are. Praise God. I don't want to keep you any longer.